A midweek game against Gillingham isn't normally the type of event you'd think of as a game to inspire. But you know what? The kids are all right. This is your East Spurs podcast. Hi guys, welcome to your weekly roundup of all things THFC. Don't forget, we want you guys to stay in touch with all things eSpurs and subscribe to the show via iTunes or on Acast and you'll get every new episode direct as it's released. Uh, we're also on social media. You can find us on Twitter at E underscore Spurs, same handle for Instagram. And you can like our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash e spurs page or one word we're also on youtube so you can check out not only the podcast but also our new e spurs classic videos and um, the links to all e spurs platforms can be found on our website that's www.espurs.blogspot.co.uk on the e spurs podcast tonight we'll be talking about another busy week with a raft of new contracts signed wednesday night's thrashing of gillingham a win eventually against sunderland last weekend We'll also be taking your questions on all things Hotspur. And to round off this week's podcast, we've got a double preview for you this week, looking at the Middlesbrough game on Saturday and a long haul trip in the Champions League as we face CSKA Moscow in our second game in the competition. So we're going to try and get through all of that for you within the next 45 minutes to an hour. But to begin with, let's introduce the team that I'll be talking all things Spurs with tonight. It's Jason, John and Ian. How are you doing, lads? All right, mate. Thank you. Hello, mate. All good. Yeah, very well. Thanks, Andy. Nice to nice to be back on again. Yeah, welcome. I should say welcome back, Ian. You've been globe trotting since last we spoke. How'd it go? Fantastic. If you, Jason, John, or any of the listeners get the chance to go to Canada, and, and I know one of our listeners is over there currently, then uh, I would thoroughly recommend it. Brilliant stuff. And, and more importantly, did you manage to stay up, up to date with the results over there? Well, it, it, I was getting texts on on my phone in, in in literally the middle of nowhere from my son, <laughs> who gave me an update for the Stoke game, and then you know broke the news to us of the the Monaco game. So um, yeah, I was uh, I think I got one of them at uh, as we were going past one of the the, the major sort of landmarks over there so uh Brilliant stuff. yeah i was kept i was kept up to date well you know what it never ceases to amaze me the length our spurs fans go to to keep up keep up to date with spurs and um even even in a stadium like wembley you know when you can't get wi-fi the frantic the the, the lengths you go to to just to try and get wi-fi to uh to check out the results that are going on and and things like that brilliant stuff and welcome back great to have you back mate as always. Now we know thank you. We know guys a lot of you listen to us from uh, far flung corners of, of the planet and they include not limited to uh, Johan Fang at Johan Fang from Tranas in Sweden, Austin Holmes at Common You Spurs, Austin H who's listening from Apex in North Carolina, and Christopher Ellis who's listening tonight from Southwest France. So listen guys, big thank you to all of you who listen to the podcast each week. Really appreciate every single listen we get. And um, if you'd like a mention on next week's podcast, just drop us a line on Twitter or Facebook, use the hashtag eSpursPod or one word and we'll get you a mention on the next podcast. So let's kick off uh, the podcast and start talking about Spurs, shall we? Of course, last week, just after we'd recorded, there was a, a contract signed and since then there's been a whole raft of deals for players currently at the club signed and completed. Um, first one signed last week was Tom Carroll. We'll come on to that one in just a moment because I know there's differing views on that one. Also, during the course of the week, we've we've signed Deli Alley to a new deal and today the latest being Danny Rose. So, great news for Spurs, you would think. Um, let's talk about that, shall we? Let's go first up. Ian, you're, you're fresh back this week, so let's get your views on those. Good to see the youngsters signed up. Oh, most definitely. And, and it's been quite interesting to see because historically, you know, but I'll say historically, the last you know, five, 10, even 15 years, we've been a club that has almost seemed to have, you know, developed players and then they've been happy to sort of, um, you know, string it out for a move and a decent deal elsewhere. And I think it's great. And I think it's indicative of the spirit within the club and and the work that Potocino has done that, you know, a, a lot of the current first team squad, you know, and those on the periphery and, and, and some of the youngsters are so in tune with the club and, and, and are happy to sign on for us for what is in effect quite a, a long period of time, you know. So, you know, I think it's fantastic news. It really is good because these players are often, by them staying with the club, 
they, they're often just as good as the marquee signings we were all sort of like clamouring for at the start of the season, mm. you know, because they, they give you that platform and that stability to go on and, and you know, develop as, as a unit. So, yeah, I think it's fantastic news. It certainly is. And Jay, for you, which of those that have signed this week has been the most important that we've tied down to a new deal, do you think? Well, Ali's one, I think, is the is the massive one because Ali is the one that I think would be coveted by pretty much every club out there at the moment. Yeah. So, and uh, obviously at his age, um, and the the worry that another sparkling season for him, I think he was the one that was always going to go. Although I think also uh, I think Danny Roses is an excellent one because I think with Manchester City would be looking out for possibly two fullbacks coming up at the, come the end of the season. And Chelsea obviously want a, a left-sided wing-back and things like that, although I wouldn't worry about him going to Chelsea so much. But <laughs> uh, just for that image of Guardiola, if, if City were to go on and win the league and we didn't make the, the top four this year, I think you know it w- wouldn't surprise me come the summer if, we're, if we are facing a situation where City come in for Danny Rose. But uh, and obviously, um, you know, he seems to be more than happy to stay at the club and... and you know, we're in a nice position now to have, have got him tied down for the five years. Absolutely. And of course, Eric Dyer again, another one that signed before we, we recorded last week. So certainly getting them all tied down, John, aren't they? And I mean, do you think we're seeing this raft of, because they have all come at once, haven't they? Is this now a case, do you think, of Pochettino swinging things now and us being able to keep the players because of Pochettino? Or is it a case, do you think, solely of money talking and Levy starting to pay up? <laughs> I think it's a bit of both, but I would like to think that it's purely down to the manager because in the two years he's been there, of our strongest 11, it's really only three players that weren't there when he turned up, mm. which being Alderweireld, Ali and Dyer. And I know they're important parts of our team now. You know, there was there's eight players that were available to Tim Sherwood, for example, or AVB slightly before. You know, that they could have decided that that's what they wanted to do then and dedicate their future to Tottenham Hotspur, but... It was so uncertain that time around the club and, you know, was the manager going to stay? So much going on. And I think now Pochettino's just managed to... I don't know, everything seems so serene at the minute. Yeah. It worries me a little bit because it's never going to last long. <laughs> this is Tottenham after all. <laughs> when we're yet to hear of any sort of grumblings or anyone being unhappy within the squad and everyone comes out and they're quite happy to publicly say, it, you know, what a great group it is and how, how much the manager's developed them and other players and stuff. So... For me, I just think it's in such a good position at the minute. I think the club is in such a healthy state. I honestly can't remember the last time that it was like that. And I'm not even talking about just on the pitch. Although we saw these, you know, the youngsters who come on and perform so admirably last night. Everything's just going our way at the minute. You know, you've got to put that down to the manager because why weren't it happening under previous regimes? So, yeah, for me, I'd like to think it's Pochettino and I believe I believe it is, really, because, you know, like I say, the, would those kind of players put pen to paper for five, six years, or well, six years in Ali's case, if, you know, Sherwood was there, for example, well, they probably wouldn't have done. Well, that's I'm sure, you know, that's uh, an, another factor, that, isn't it? You know, the manager's commitment to Spurs and I'm sure the players are aware of that. And Christian Eriksen is another one, you know, who's, who signed a new contract. And um, we'll come on to him in just a moment. Ian, in terms of the, the contracts, one player who hasn't signed just yet, um, who we're all keeping everything cross for, I think, is, is Hugo Lloris. There's been lots of talk, isn't there, about Lloris and whether or not maybe he's waiting till next summer. And um, some Spurs fans saying, well, if he goes, then, you know, he'll go with our blessings. He's done brilliantly for us. Others saying, you know, we've got to, I mean, he's, you know, our captain, we've got to get him tied down to a new contract next. What's your thoughts on Lloris? I think he, he comes across as a very principled man. You know, whenever you sort of either hear him speak or you hear some quotes that were, were, were attributed to him, I, I think the, the last sort of like noise is that he was, you know, happy in, in the club and with the setup. So it would be great, you know, for, for us to, to, to tie him down. But when it comes to a, a keeper of that quality, um, if you can't play at the highest level, then... You know, it's a bit like the Bell scenario. You know, sometimes you have to just be thankful that you'd actually seen them play in a Spurs shirt and wish them well. But, you know, I'm hopeful that under Pochettino and with this current crop of players that, you know, we can go on and provide Hugo with the platform and and, and the group of players and the competitions that allow him to stay. Because, you know, he's been here for a while now and I often think that... um, well, I'm sure people like you know John and Jason will will attribute to this that um, if your wife's happy, then 
you're going to be happy. Um, so, you know, obviously, is it Marine? You know, she seems yeah. to be happy and settled here. So, you know, I'm, I'm sure that um, a lot depends on what competitions we're in. But I think he will stay if, if we can provide him with those platforms. I really hope so. I mean, I'm not a big fan of having a, a goalkeeper as a captain. But I think if you are going to have your goalkeeper as captain, you want someone like him, you know, sort of Uzi's class, doesn't he? Very quietly spoken, but when he does speak, I'm sure they listen. Um, and with the performances he puts in, he, he really does lead by example, doesn't he? So, yeah. um, Jay, just to finish up on contracts tonight, there's one player in there who, to say it's been um, talked about on social media, is probably an understatement. Mr Tom Carroll, what's your, your thoughts on young Tom? Well, I think he's, it's, it's wrong to call him Mr. Carroll. I think we have to call him Captain Carroll now, don't we? <laughs> After last night, I think that was a... I never thought I'd be sitting there at White Hart Lane seeing Tom Carroll having the captain's arm <laughs> and unless it was a... Obviously, unless it was a youth team game. But, you know, I'm not anti-Tom Carroll. I think he's a, he's a good little footballer, but that's it. You know, I'm not so sure he's a, a top six footballer, I think. Probably his his home would be, say, at Bournemouth or something like that, in mm. fairness to him. Um, and I think, you know, it, at, at Tom Carroll's age, I've always been of the opinion that if you're going to make your way as a Tottenham player, then you'd become a regular by now. And he's been, you know, he's been in and around the first team long enough to him to impose his will and, and stamp his authority on a game and, and demand a place. And we, we still haven't seen that. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think that was a, a strange one for sure. And I think also it's a struggle to see how he'll get game time, isn't it? Because mm. Dyer, Wanyama... Um, Sissoko, people like that in midfield plus then trying to give a pathway through to uh, Harry Winks who I thought had an excellent first 70 minutes last night um, faded a little bit over those last 20 minutes but you know the game was at 5-0 already and perhaps he just used a, used a professional's head and thought I'd done enough for the night but mm. um, you know even Josh Onomar's on that and I think without those young boys going out on loan so that they're still in and around the first team squad it's hard to see where Tom Carroll is going to get game time to, to, to have 20 games to justify a new contract. But, um, you know, as I say, I think he's a good little footballer, but he's perhaps not, not for the Tottenham that's trying to challenge at the very top level for trophies and top four places. Yeah, and I know there's going to be people who say, oh, you know, they're talking about Tom Carroll, anti, anti-Tom anti Carroll, and it's not that at all. We've also, in the course of all of this, let some, some other Spurs homegrown players play, and I'm not... Ryan Mason's biggest fan by any stretch of the imagination. I think he's a very committed player, very another sort of Bournemouth level player, isn't he? But I personally would keep uh, Ryan Mason over Tom Carroll. Uh, I think certainly a, a strange one, um, but no bad feeling towards Tom Carroll at all. He's always put in 110, percent hasn't he? And um, giving his all. Just a word on Ryan Mason. What a fantastic oh, goal he scored last night. Brilliant, wasn't it? You know, I mean, he scored a cracking one for us on his debut in the League Cup against Forest, and that, I think that was his first start, wasn't it, for Hull last night? And yep. you know, that's off to the blow. That was an absolutely fantastic goal. And they're all doing, aren't they, Jay? All the ex Spurs lads uh, putting in a shift at the moment. You've got Chadley scoring for fun. Well, I think that, you know it's an indication, as I say, of Tom Carroll. They're, they're good footballers. You know, Sigerson was the same, and they're good, solid footballers, and they can be Premier League players. Yeah, but they're perhaps not top four, top six players. Yeah. But, um, you know, I hate it when people sit in the crowd on that and and you get that, he's absolute S-H-I-T or whatever. Yeah. You think, I mean, I even had that last Sunday about Hugo Lloris because he couldn't, he missed a couple of goal kicks and the bloke behind him saying, oh, if he was in Guardiola's side, we'd have kicked him out by now. This bloke's yeah. absolutely F-F dot dot dot. And you're thinking, do what, mate? Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on, get a touch of reality in you. They're not that, le- they're not certainly not that level. And I think most of us will have seen players like, you know, Gary Doherty and people like that. And... <laughs> well, you know, it's it's interesting talking about youngsters because I suppose we, we should move on and, and start talking about some, some football. And of course, at the weekend, um, we beat Sunderland. But let's, I think let's focus on last night, shall we? Because it was such a, a great night. We were all, all the East Spurs team were there. So let's talk about that. John, first up, I mentioned this at the top of the show. What was even more inspiring was seeing these this team of 11 changes and these kids who we've seen bits and pieces of and they've sometimes performed, sometimes not, just absolutely wiped the floor, didn't they, with Gillingham last night? 
<laughs> they did, yeah. I mean, we, we can we can sit here and say, well, it's a team 13th. I think they are in League One against a team who are third in the Premier League. So when you look at it like that, you know, that's that's exactly what should have happened. But, yeah, you make 11 changes, it's always a risk, especially, you know, we see what happened with West Ham and they just about scraped past Accrington Stanley last <laughs> night, which was hilarious. But, yeah, you know, I think you've got 11 young players there and it wouldn't be beyond the realm of possibility that, you know, they're, inv- they're involved again in some capacity on Saturday. I think that's the difference. Before you had, a, we've always had managers who are very much, this is my 11 and that's it. Whereas with Poch, I think you come in and you play well. Then there's every chance that, all right, they might, you know, this this take Harry Winks, for example. I think he was my player of the night last night just for the way he was so neat and tidy and he never he never lost the ball. He uses it intelligently. Yeah. The positioning was good. He covered well. We started attacks from deep. He really, really impressed me. Now, because of that and because of the manager that we've got there, there's every chance that Poch will give him a chance again on Saturday, maybe start him on the bench. You know, I know Winks has been on the bench a lot already this season, but it sort of gives hope to these players. They're not just coming in going, well, well I'm playing tonight, but that's it for three months now or whatever. Yeah. You know, So I think that a lot of that has to do with it as well. We've got to thank the manager for that. But yeah, no, it really was. It was a good night and it was nice to be able to sit there after, you know, 50 minutes and be completely relaxed. <laughs> but when the Gillingham fans are, st- are singing, you know, 3 0 when you still don't sing at that point, and you're like, you know what, you're right, but I'm not going to start singing. I'm just going to chill out now, enjoy the night. <laughs> On Sunday, my, my throat was killing me against Sunderland. It was, a, it was a very vocal performance from us in the Park Lane end <laughs> on Sunday. And it, purely because you're running on your nerves a little bit. Yeah. Whereas last night, it weren't the case. And I would like to say, if I may, before everyone starts jumping on the back of Vincent Janssen, <laughs> the last time a Dutchman scored his first goal at the Paxton End Road from a, the penalty spot was a certain Mr. Raphael van der Vaart, and that turned out all right. I like it. But the only thing is, he's probably a little bit predictable to play against because he always wants it on one side. Where that's, you know, with Harry Kane, he can take it on both sides, and I think that's the only one little criticism I'd have of Janssen is the fact that he's so one-footed. <laughs> but it was, listen, it was a great performance last night. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, you know, every single player was, was top class, especially Amela, you know, three assists and a goal. What more can you ask for? Yeah. We dispatched them with ease. You certainly did. I mean, you know, the, the, I thought second half, the movement was great. Ian, what you was, as I say, you was also there. What did you make of the night? Yeah, I, I, you know, I echo, you know, basically what John just said. You know, you read about these, these youngsters and the Edwardses, the Winks... Uh, the walks and the onomers and we've seen we've seen Josh on of course but you know you, you read about the other lads and and you know they, they come on and they didn't look out of place and as Jason said earlier I thought Winks you know for 70 minutes was very impressive you know and I think that um, it was interesting that when Onama scored you know he, he, he ran over to you know some of the I think it was walks and, and Edwards were warming up and, and he ran over to him and it obviously can you can obviously see what it meant to him and what it meant to his mate who have, have, have obviously played with him and, and, and have grown up with him. And, and Jay, in many respects, it was a brave uh, lineup selected by Pochettino, wasn't it? Because, I mean, we've seen, you saw Man United last night sort of scrape through in the end, West Ham. These games can, as we know, being Spurs fans, can very easily go, you know, pear shaped. So it was a brave lineup bringing in 11 different players for the game, but it, it worked and, and, and then some, didn't it? Yeah, but there's a real zest. To their, those youngsters when they come in, I think John's right. There's that feeling that when they get in the side, they're genuinely going to have a chance beyond that, rather than just being the token youngster that's coming in as a, oh well, you can play in the Carling Cup because we don't want whatever it's now called the EFL or whatever, because we just don't want to get this player injured. So you know, someone's going to break the leg tonight. It's better to be you type of thing that yeah. you get from some of the clubs. But um, you know, it was that real zest. I think the, there are a couple of things. I think Ericsson and Lamella do need a, a mention because, you know, it was a really young side, particularly in, in the midfield. And yet those two, you know, they certainly showed, led by example, didn't they, as yeah. well? They, they didn't consider the game was a bit below that. It would have been so easy for them to coast it, particularly even at 2-0 and thought, well, that's a job done. But, um, you know, they continued to play well. And I thought Lamella was, was excellent and I'm really pleased that he scored. It was nice to see Kevin Wimmer as well. We now know he's not died. He's back. <laughs> uh, which, is, which is nice to see because... Um, you know, I think we'd all been a little bit concerned about him, but I, th- I thought the one, my one negative, because I was really high last night in block forty nine. I was only about. I wonder two what you was going to say there, so. Jay. I no, they're no, not high on drugs. Don't worry. <laughs> really high, but there seemed to be a huge reluctance of Ben Davis to even go forward. Yeah. In that first half, and there were a couple of times you could really see them look left, 
And we know there's a difference between Danny Rose and Ben Davis going forward. But at least in other games, Ben Davis has tried to get forward. But in that first half, mm-hmm. it was as if he was totally reluctant to go more than five or ten yards across the halfway line. Yeah. And so we completely, everything that we had to do in that first half was going down the right-hand side. And I was a little bit surprised. And and then as within a minute of the second half restarting, Ben Davis suddenly appeared uh, you know, about eight yards out from goal. So whether Pochettino had had a real blast at him at half time, and I'm I'm starting to worry a little bit for him because having missed the Sunderland game, mm. you start to think if you can't get a game at left back when Danny Rose is injured and we're at home to the team bottom of the league, and we're going to play with a centre half at left back who's probably no better going forward in respects than Ben Davis. Yeah. Then you know it would suggest that there's there's a problem with him, and I noticed. You know, Waltz came on for him last night, didn't he? Yeah. Rather than, than say, going over on the right-hand side. But um, Ben Davis apart, you know, it was it was a it was the performance we'd have wanted and, and nice and comfortable. And, you know, let's hope for the same at Anfield. Call him an old-fashioned type full-back, isn't he? You know, doesn't get forward too much, does his job very well at the back, but doesn't... He's not a Danny Rose by any stretch of the imagination, is he? You know, getting no. forward. I thought maybe the, the, the only thing in fairness to him is... Is, is possibly with, I think, maybe with Carroll and Winks in uh, as the midfield two, rather than, say, which I thought it would be, as Wanyama and one of those. Maybe they just thought, we don't want we don't want both fullbacks bombing on and, and, and then getting caught on the break or something. And yeah. once we got that second goal, then it was a little bit of, all right, I don't mind you moving forward a bit more. So, I mean, maybe he'd been told, but it did seem strange that he was just completely reluctant to even get forward. Yeah, he certainly did. And uh, I mean, second half, things opened up, didn't they? And, and, you know, no exaggeration. Some of the football second half was scintillating. You know, the the one touch, um, one twos going forward into Janssen. I thought Janssen's movement after he got the goal was was so much better. You just see him come alive after he after he got the goal. First half, he was a little bit static, a little bit flat footed, but they all all were, you know, to be fair. Um, Missed a couple of chances, didn't he, in the first half, which I think, um, you know, sort of brought a wry, wry smile from from many Spurs fans but once he got that goal he, his movement was fantastic and he looked so hungry um, so that's that's all, all bodes well for the future certainly um, listen lads we're going to move on to um, the next part of the podcast which is of course every week your questions for the East Spurs team which you again have been brilliant in getting your questions into us guys and we'll put some of those to the panel right now so first question of this week's East Spurs podcast goes to Ian Ian this is from Kev Green he asked, should Pochettino keep the same type of team for the game against Liverpool, who, of course, we've got in the next round, or should we go stronger, seeing as Liverpool will probably put out a near to full strength side in that game? I'm of the opinion that if it isn't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. And, you know, I think sometimes you've got to keep faith with, with the team that gets you through a, a knockout competition. You know, I would look at it and... There might be some areas that that you might want to look at, and you know I think Jason's very intelligently picked up on 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 the left back situation with Davis. Mm. There might be some of the places that you might want to look at, but why would you want to change? You know, and at the end of the day, I know we've all said we like to to go on and you know win win some silverware this year, but. You know, outside of that, you know, wh- why should you perhaps, you know, substitute, you know, someone like Winks or, 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 or not give Edwards, you know, 20 minutes at Anfield instead of the 10 odd he got, you know, at White Hart Lane last night? So, no, I, I think that um, you, you have a strong bench, you know, because ultimately what you don't want to do is you don't want it to become embarrassing, you know, and, and, you, and you have to have the opportunity just to bring a. I was going to say bring an old head on, but you might bring Pitali <laughs> Ali on, who's, who's probably, you know, about an eight, a, a year or two older than some of the, some of the youngsters we're talking about. And John, how would you play it? Well, I think you know, it sandwiches. I believe it's Bournemouth and Leicester. The game is between, so it's not like no disrespect to Bournemouth or Leicester. I know we shouldn't underestimate Leicester, but <laughs> you know, it's not like it, it's it's not like it's sandwiched between Arsenal and Chelsea, for example. So I'd imagine it will be. The bulk of the team would be the same as it was last night, but I do think it will be slightly stronger. So I, I can see, you know, one of our usual centre halves playing instead of Cameron, Vic, uh, Cameron Carter Vickers, for example. But yeah, I think you know that them boys do deserve another chance. I think to be honest, and it will probably do them good in terms of their development because if they if they're only playing League One teams, you know they're going to think, well, this is easy. And then when they do actually get to play against a side who are 
as good or better than they are, yeah. then they might struggle a little bit. You know, they need that competitiveness to, to develop as players. There's no point in beating teams 5-0 every week because you're not really learning too much about yourself as an individual. So, you know, I think it, it do the likes of Winks, for example, good. I think the player Anfield and, you know, sample the atmosphere in front of a full crowd under the lights. So, yeah, I think depending on where we are, obviously, in terms of injuries at the time and suspensions, maybe I'd, I'd probably go just a little bit stronger than last night, but not too many changes. And Jay? I think, as, as John said, I think we would go stronger. I, I definitely think, particularly away at Liverpool and the way that they're playing at the moment, you'd need a better midfield than, um, or a stronger midfield than Carroll and Winks at the base of those two. So I'd certainly see Wanyama coming in for for one of, probably for probably for Tom Carroll. Um, but, you know, the rest of the side, you still had Lamella, you still had Eriksen, you still had Janssen, you still had two two proper fullbacks. Um Maybe Toby in there at centre half, but you know only really Toby and Toby and um, Wanyama would come in for me, and then leave the rest as it is. We know that my, uh, Michel Vaughan's already proven himself against Liverpool this season, so no no need to change that either. Yeah, absolutely. I was walking walking back last night when the draw came through, and sort of first reaction was, ah, uh, you know, typical typical Spurs type draw, wasn't it? You know, away at Anfield, whereas that lot down the road get a nice tidy little tie in the next round. But on second thoughts, thinking about it, actually, maybe it's a bit of a blessing. You know, we want we want these sorts of games to test our youngsters. You know, we we all pretty much agreed that as much as we'd like to win the the League Cup again. You know, it, it's a tournament we can use for these youngsters this season. Um, I'd love to see them get to Wembley and win it again. You know, home ground as it is now. But I think it'd be it'd be great, as you say, for them to go to Anfield, experience a big night under the lights, and um, and hopefully get get us through. If they get us through that that tie, you're then talking because it's quite short the the League Cup in terms of rounds. You're then talking sort of quarterfinals. So who knows? Um, and I don't think the expect there's no pressure on them, is there? Because I don't think any of us realistically expect them to go up there and beat a full strength Liverpool side. But you know, if they do, then then fantastic. Um, there's there's nothing to lose really. They can go up there with that sort of attitude. I think be a great night for them. Um, next question, lads, is from Sean at Sean Declan Leo. Um, this is for John. John, he asks, how many more contract announcements would you expect and who? Well, it, apart from the Tom Carroll one, it looks like they was all done at once. Yeah. Uh, if you look at it, it's quite funny because I've seen some, maybe maybe you call them conspiracy theorists, <laughs> <laughs> say this, where Pochettino's hair is exactly the same <laughs> and he's, his facial hair is at exactly the same length. I love it. I love the fact that there's these Spurs fans out there forensically <laughs> examining these pictures. Brilliant. <laughs> Do you know what? You know what? I've seen that. I've seen this tweet and I, I, I went back and had a look and I must say, I do agree. It does look <laughs> like they was all done at once. Is right, it the real Potter? Is it? a cardboard cutout picture <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is you'd hope that um, Kyle Walker and Jan Vertonghen as they're the two that have been touted and they're the, you know, they're two that haven't signed a new one for a while hopefully it'd be those two you know they're both very important to the team Yeah. and you look, you look further on than that really I think everyone's in a decent position in terms of contract length Oh, sorry, Eric Lamella, I forgot as well. Although I've heard a rumour that he's um, there was a, a two-year option which was triggered anyway at the end of the third year, so his five-year deal becomes seven. I'm not sure if that's true. Right. If it is, then he's still got four years to go. So I would say the next two will probably be Walker and Vertonghen. So on Spurs, isn't it, to have everybody secured down to long-term deals? I mean, the commitment from the club is certainly there. They're certainly putting their money where their mouth is now and getting these players signed up. So well, even the players, like you hear Danny Rose today yeah. saying, you know, he wants to stay for the rest of his career and things like that. Yeah. And I think, you know what, it's so good to hear. You know, one thing that I was, I was thinking about earlier is how much money would it cost to replace Danny Rose? Well, yeah. And it's the same with Ali and Dyer and all the other players that have signed up recently. You're, you're talking about keeping a quality player and saving a lot of money and trying to find a replacement. So it's really good business by the club as well as, you know, pleasing for us. Best left back in the Premier League now, John, do you think? I would say he's the most consistent, definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, he was in the play team of the year last year, wasn't he? And he's gone from nowhere to England's left back. So, I've, you know, I can't think of any other left backs, you know, who have had that kind of rise. Maybe if Luke Shaw didn't get injured last season he might be up there challenging him but you look at like Leighton Baines has fallen away yeah. Kieran Gibbs don't get anywhere near the Arsenal team any 
anymore. You know, Chelsea have had problems there. They've signed Marcus Alonso for big money. And you, you know, there ain't really any others that stand out. I would say, yeah, I think we've got the best left back in the, in the league, definitely, yeah. And of course, due a testimonial. So he's been there, I think, 10 years <laughs> this year. So I think there were, there were actually, I saw a few calls for his the last game ever at White Hart Lane to be Danny Rose's testimony. It'd be a lovely occasion if that were the case. But um, I'm sure they're going to want to get the bricks and mortar down quick smart after that Man United game. So I'm not sure, you know, if that'll happen, but absolutely brilliant chuff for him. Last question of the night, lads, is to Jay. This is from Austin Holmes, Jay. He asked, realistically, how many goals can you see Vincent Janssen scoring while Kane is out? So let me put it to you like this. Can you see him becoming a 20-goal-a-season a player for Spurs? Well, it depends if we get any more penalties, doesn't it? <laughs> the few people that have compared him to Soldado, I think, compared him even more last night when you <laughs> thought, well, he can certainly take a penalty. Yeah. I th- you know, I think that, that goal will have done him the world of good. I think, um, I mean, he had that really good chance, didn't he, with his head last night uh, in that first half yeah. from close in. And it was a type of chance you think that if, if he'd have scored a few times before and he'd just let the pace of the ball, just almost let it hit him on the head and it would have would have gone in. But he kind of tried to get too cute with it, didn't he, and angle it into the top corner and, yeah. and just got too much angle on it where you know a little bit more instinctive with a bit more confidence I'm sure he'd just let it as I say hit his head I think a little bit like John said a bit worried that he wants to take everything on one side Mm. and always turned one way but um we'll we'll find out won't we It's, it's really difficult to know you can't say one way or the other how it'll go because we just haven't seen enough of him I actually fancy him to score on Saturday and I think once he gets that first Premier League goal then then you'll see a different Jensen. But I think if you he won't score as many Premier League goals in a season as Kane would do if they, they both had the same number of games, I think. There's a, a little bit more to Harry than there is to Jensen, but I think he'll be a more than capable replacement over the next few weeks. There was talk Kane's injury actually isn't as bad as all the media are on about and that it, it would won't actually be anywhere near that eight weeks. So That'd be you nice. know, hopefully Hopefully that little bit of insight is true and it's not a traditional ITK piece of information, which is never true. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be fa- certainly be fantastic if, if that was true. And just want to ask you, Jay, about Janssen moving forward, because, of course, Kane is, we're all pretty much agreed, Kane is the main man up there. So as soon as he's fit to come back in, realistically, we expect him to come straight back in. So do you think, moving forward, Janssen's going to be happy playing this permanent second second fiddle to, to Harry Kane, do you think we can keep him happy? Well, I think he'd have had his initial role explained to him. Yeah. But I, I wouldn't say Kane will come straight back in. I think Pochettino's, I think Pochettino's quite fair. I, if Vincent Jensen scores at Middlesbrough and then he scores in Moscow and then he scores against Manchester City, or he certainly gets two in those three games and, and plays well in those games. And, and continues to play well going forward, then there's no rush to bring Kane back in. And I don't think Kane would walk in if Jensen does the business. Mm. But obviously, if Jensen only scores one in seven or eight and generally struggles, then, then of course, the clamour for Kane will come in, will to come straight back in will be there. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice problem to have, isn't it, when you've got two two goal scorers up there. When you bear in mind last season, how much we, we sweated it out last season, didn't we, with the... You know, just having Kane up there, it's lovely to have Janssen in there now. And as we say, the movement second half from him, I thought was really good. To see him um, looking for space all the time. And um, it was just lovely football last night, I thought, in the second half. Brilliant stuff. OK, so that's the questions for this week, guys. Don't forget, you can send them in to us every week via our Twitter and our Facebook at E underscore Spurs on the Twitter. And the Facebook is E Spurs page or one word. Give us a like on there um, if you enjoy the podcast. And send in your questions using the hashtag EspursPod, all one word, and we'll get those up on next week's um, episode. So on to a busy week ahead again um, with two games coming up in a short space of time. Of course, the first being the game up at uh, Middlesbrough on the Saturday, and then we face CSKA Moscow, a long trip to Moscow on Tuesday. So uh, a long haul flight there. Let's start with Middlesbrough, shall we? And of course, Having a, having a difficult season back in, in the top flight, Middlesbrough, 13th in the league at the moment. Just looking at their, their previous results, um, 3-1 they've lost against Everton recently, uh, 2-1 defeat against Palace, few others in there, but really dire form, I think it's fair to say. Um, so we should go into this one, Ian, in, in full spirits and, and full of optimism. You know, I think that you know, if, we, if we go back to the, the game against Sunderland, there was a lot of people that were huffing and puffing, but we, I don't think we were ever in any danger of, of, of not coming out of the game with something. And we just had to be patient and bide our time. And, and, and the goal eventually came. And I think 
a borough will try to start on the front foot, but I think we've got the players who can rapidly get them on the back foot and then it'll be us trying to break them down again and um, I'm looking forward to it because it'll be my first ever visit to the Riverside this weekend so I'm hopeful for a pleasant trip that's not going to be spoilt by the football <laughs> and that long journey home on the coach um, let's hope it's a, an enjoyable one after a, a lovely win up there and and John I mean it is the sort of game we should go into hoping uh, and almost expecting uh, a positive result however it doesn't always work that way does it we know up at Middlesbrough in recent years it's sort of been hot and cold our form up there but these are different times aren't they I, I would like to think so you know as you said they, they have struggled a bit recently I, I watched their game with Everton last Saturday and uh, they didn't offer any type of threat at all to Everton's back four after I know they got their goal which was shouldn't have stood probably but it will play out a little bit like the Sunderland game last weekend for us I think I can see us having a lot of the ball and a lot of the chances, and if we can put one away earlier than the 59th minute, you know, that we, you know, like we managed against Sunderland, it should go on to be quite um, a comfortable win. But mm. again, that's one of them things that you can't guarantee with Tottenham at the minute. What you can guarantee is plenty of chances created, a lot of craft, a lot of guile, you know, in- incredible work rate. But it's just been that slow start, and even against Gillingham, you know, it took half an hour for us to get a goal, which is not too bad <laughs> compared to some, you know, compared to Palace, for example, or even Sunderland. But yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to the first goal and the timing of it. If we get it and it's relatively early, I can see it playing out to be a comfortable away win. I think it's going to be quite a tight one, one, one by the odd goal. I just hope that it's us that managed to sneak it, sneak it on our side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's going to be a, a game with some degree of pressure because. You look at the other games, Jay, and and it's just one of those weekends where the fixtures around us fall that Chelsea are playing Arsenal. So in some ways, it's almost a bit of a six-pointer, isn't it? Because if we get the three points up at Middlesbrough, one of those others are going to drop points. And it then puts us in, I mean, we're already third, but then puts us in an even better position, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think we also want to take full advantage of getting that win against Sunderland, get get another three points on the ball, because then, of course, you go into Manchester City. And um, without looking too far ahead, you know, that could be a very different day. So it is important, I think. I think the first little bit, the the first 15 minutes will be really big because whilst they're they're back in the Premier League, we're the first of the, I don't want to be too full of praise for ourselves, but we are the first big team to go there. Mm. And so that will will be a a big thing for their supporters. And I'm sure they're they're looking forward to that and thinking, right, now we've got one of the big boys coming up. So I think there'll be a, a, a little bit even more atmosphere up there and a little bit more of a buzz to their play. I think when you're one of the big boys going to a, a newly promoted club, I think they almost see that as a, a little bit of a free hit, that they'll think, look, our, our chance to get points is against the is against teams from you know mid-table downwards. So against Spurs, come on, let's have a real go and, and try and do this. And I think they'll they'll try and try and attack us where possible. And it's it's a question I'm sure that we'll we'll get that little period in the game where they'll have a couple of corners and a couple of dangerous free kicks and they'll have that little five or six minute spell where you're you're kind of under the cosh. Uh, and Stoke had that very early on, didn't they? But I think we're a different Tottenham side now. We seem to be able to absorb those types of periods. And I think it's it's a question of our ability coming through and if we apply ourselves in the right way, we accept that Middlesbrough will have a little bit of a go at us. We don't get completely complacent and think, well, this should be a, a piece of cake. But if we apply ourselves properly, then I'm sure we'll go on and win the game. And selection-wise, Jay, would you go back with Fatongan back at left-back again? No, I, I don't want to see Ian at left-back because I think... Is is far better in the centre of the defence because I don't see what Yang gives you as a left back going forward. You know he's not going to do what Danny Rose does going forward, is he? No. So for me, let's just leave the square peg in the square hole. For me, he's a left sided centre back, and despite what I said earlier about Ben Davis, I would you know I'd go with Davis at left back and Yang. Yeah, and back into the centre. I agree. And, you know, I think the, the results are all the proof you need, really, of that. I mean, just so reliable. And then the Reese behind them, it's just, it just doesn't get much better than that, really, does it? Exactly. I think, you know, I think we, we're genuinely true to say that they're the best centre-back pairing. Yeah. You know, there might be other other supporters will argue that there's a better centre-back, for instance, than Vertonghen is. But I think as a, as a pair, 
I can't see a better pair, and therefore, why would you separate them? I, I just don't see why you'd suddenly put one at left back. And we laugh at Belgium for separating them. Mm. So I, I really don't see the, the benefit in us separating them. Not not for the benefits it would bring. No, absolutely. It's um, I mean, talking to best centre backs, I know Eric Bailey was being lauded as one of the best centre backs in in Europe, wasn't he, at the start of the season? Crikey, I don't know if anyone saw his performance um, last week, but um, don't even think, even think he's the best centre back in in Manchester at the moment, let alone Europe, um, considering the money they paid for him. So it's lovely to have them two guys so reliable, so cool, aren't they, and calm going about their job. No fuss at all about them. You hardly notice they're there at times and. Just fan- and they can go forward as well, which is even even better. So, I'll tell you what, let's get the predictions after we've done CSK. So, we'll get them all together tonight. Um, CSK, I'm not going to pretend that I'm any knowledgeable figure on Russian football whatsoever. Um, all I do know is they, they drew with Leverkusen 2-2 in their last Champions League game, of course. So, fairly evenly matched with Leverkusen. The big um, test here, Ian, is going to be the travelling, isn't it, I think? Yeah, I've, I've been to, to Russia um, a couple of years ago. On, on a holiday and it's a long way over to Moscow you know if, if any of our listeners are going to be going over there I would urge them to be careful and, and, and not too over the top with regard to what they're there for and what, and what they're going to support because you know there, there is a there is an undercurrent of possible problems over there with regard to the hooliganism element that we saw at the, the Euros mm. so I would genuinely urge people to show a little bit of respect and restraint when they go over there. For, for, for my dealings with the Russian people, you know, they are quite intrigued to see and, and to talk to people from the UK. Um, and, and like you, I don't know too, too much about CSK, but um, any team that has got into the Champions League and going to be no mugs and, you know, we're, we're going to have to go over there and, and have a really good game plan to sort of like come out of the game with something which I think we need to do one thing I I do know I think I'm right in saying they're playing in a new stadium um, this year so of course there's going to be that first season syndrome almost for them in in their new stadium that we've seen so so many times in the UK with teams moving into a new stadium still getting used to and adapting to their new stadium however I know from pictures that I've seen across the internet their their fan base you know as you would expect are one of the most partisan um, let's say fan bases out there so it's going to be a difficult atmosphere I think to, to play in in terms of the lineup John with the, the Premier League game sandwiched either side, what sort of team would you go with for this one? It's got to be as strong as possible. I mean, we're, we're talking about potentially if we lose, you know, then you're talking about a very tricky road back to qualification through this group. Yeah. So obviously the manager will, will understand that. You know, we can see it. So I would imagine it will be, you know, the strongest team that's available will, will play. In the, in the first game, Jace, we saw a lineup that there were a few surprises in there, wasn't there? Wan Yama, what would you put out there on? Would you go with um, a similar lineup to that that we saw against maybe Sunderland, a Premier League lineup? Uh, I'd certainly have a conventional back four. I'd certainly have Dyer moved into midfield, probably alongside um, Musa Dembele. And then, you know, then the three players in front of them. You know, Janssen picks himself, obviously, but you can, you've can you then got the choice, haven't you, whether you want Son, Ericsson, Ali, Lamella, and, uh, you know, one of those logically will miss out. Sissoko comes into that category as well, doesn't he, of those yeah. forward three players. So, um, for me, maybe it would be Ericsson one side, Ali and Lamella, I think, would probably be the three that would be in front for me. But, I mean, looking at CSKA, they've played 24 Champions League games in the last three seasons. They've only won five wow. of those 24. They've lost 13 because obviously they have to go through the qualifier each year. And even the, the teams that have gone there, Roma have gone there, Wolfsburg have gone there, both Manchester clubs have gone there and none of them have lost a game. So, you know, when you look at that, they may be a, a, a decent side, but, it, you know, the, there's nothing for us to be too scared of there. Ahmed Moussa they sold in the summer to Leicester. Uh, Dumbia, who used to score goals, and he's now on loan at Roma. So they brought the boy in from Monaco, giant six foot eight inch striker, which might give you an idea of the type of way they want to play their football going forward. But um, I certainly don't see anything to to be frightened of. We we must go and at least get a point, at least get a point. I think a point we'd come away disappointed, but a point wouldn't be a disaster for us by any means. And then let's then the pressure's on us, obviously, to, to pick up the, the rest of the points elsewhere. But you still got to aim, I think, for 10 points. If you get 10 points, you'll almost certainly go through a group. So, you know, with five games to go, if we get a point there, 
then you know you've still got that little bit of breathing space in the other games. Mm, and I think that's the aim, isn't it? You know, to end up with Champions League football after Christmas rather than that dreaded drop down to the the Europa League, as we know, you know, in, in previous seasons, their own experience of being in, in that competition. Um, and then you've got another dilemma. I was speaking to my brother about this last night of playing at Wembley, potentially in the Europa League, you know, where I'm sure, we, you know, I'm sure Spurs fans will turn up in numbers, but but nowhere near the, the 90,000 that we saw. So you've potentially got a, you know, half full stadium in the Europa League, which doesn't, doesn't fill you with... Uh, much uh, excitement does it so let's hope we get that Champions League football after Christmas and and then if we get that I think most Spurs fans would probably agree that's that's an achievement you know for this season getting that Champions League football after Christmas and and who knows once you're in the knockout rounds it um, becomes a bit of a lottery doesn't it it's great to, great to be in that competition isn't it fantastic that music last time we all mentioned you know the hairs stood up on the back of our neck and I'm sure it will again Sure, it will again on Tuesday night. Brilliant. OK, so let's get some predictions, shall we, lads? Let's start off with Middlesbrough away on Saturday. And Ian, your prediction? 2-1 uh, Spurs. A 2-1 Spurs, so a close fault affair. And John? Do you know what? I was going to say 2-1 anyway. Honestly, I was. But now, Ian, <laughs> I know that that's what's going to happen. So I'm going to say 2-1. <laughs> <laughs> There's a pattern for me here, John. I tell you, I'm, I'm, I'm watching you, mate. I'm <laughs> um, and Jace? I'll go 2-0 up at Borough. And 2-0, so slightly more of a buffer there, which would be lovely. Moscow on the Tuesday, Ian? 1-1. A 1-1, so a point for Spurs, according to Ian. John? Honestly, I was going to say 1-0 <laughs> as well. Right. He's done it again. I'm going to say 0-0. So, oh, 0-0. So, John's going for a 0-0. Complete shutout. And Jace? I'll go for a scruffy 2-1. A nerve bitey. Not our best football, but where where the result actually is more important than performance. And I, I fancy us to get a 2-1 there. Oh, God, Jay, I'd, I'd bite your hand off now for a 2-1, mate. I'd tell you, even a scruffy 2-1. If it came off Vincent Janssen's knee, it wouldn't bother me. I'll tell you one bit. Wouldn't that be brilliant? Um, 2-1 Spurs, according to Jay. And those are your predictions. Let us know yours, guys, on Twitter and Facebook, at E underscore Spurs and E Spurs page. See how close yours are to the E Spurs team. So that's the E Spurs podcast for another week. Thanks for listening, guys, wherever you listen to us around the globe. Don't forget to subscribe via iTunes or Acast. And on behalf of Jason, John, Ian and myself, guys, have a great week. And as always, come on, you Spurs. Last year, top